Uh, you can hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, well, thank you so much for the invitation to speak. I'm very happy to be here uh, to share some of my knowledge that I have learned over the years. So let's see here. Um, can you see my first slide? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, no, yeah. Yeah, we can see yep. it. No problem. Okay, very good. Well, I'm yeah. just going to get right into it then. Great. Excellent. Okay, so uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I actually got my PhD at Louisiana State University. Um, I think you said Mississippi, but that's fine. And uh, I was at Ohio State for 15 years, where I was the director of a mass spec and proteomics facility there. And then, um, as uh, Dr. Chen mentioned, I came here in 2014. Um, and here's a picture of my current group here. Um, and uh, we do a lot of uh, omics based um, projects uh, in our center. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, this is a standard metabolomics workflow that most people um, are going to use in a metabolomics experiment. And basically how it starts is you start with your experimental design, which is probably the most important step of a metabolomic study. So here I have, uh, we're, we're looking at uh, a wild type mouse and then the, uh, you know, a knockout mouse that doesn't get them whiskers. Um, and then we have to decide how many samples and things like that. And then we have the arduous step of sample preparation. We have the data acquisition. Then we have the data processing. And then we have the data analysis and interpretation. So the experimental design is really critical when you're talking about setting up a metabolomics experiment. And it involves a many, many factors and probably involves many, many meetings with your collaborators because there's a lot to go over. Um, so in your experimental design, you have to consider what analytical techniques you're going to be using, your sample collection, how that's going to happen, what you're gonna do, then after you collect your sample, how you're gonna prepare the sample, and then how you're gonna analyze the data. What tools do you have? Because some of the metabolomics software platforms are very expensive, upwards of 20 or $40,000. Then there is freeware that uh, maybe takes a little bit to learn. Um, people don't necessarily always like to have to code and things like that. So all of these things have to be considered. So when we talk about analytical techniques, you know, what instrumentation are you going to use? What instrumentation do you have available? What polarity are you interested in? Uh, is, your, is your primary focus, your metabolites of interest going to be in negative mode or positive mode? Do you want both positive and negative mode? What kind of chromatography are you gonna be using? Are you gonna be using reverse phase? Are you gonna be using hillock columns? Um, are you going to have quality control samples and what are those going to look like? And are you going to have to do a validation step for your study? So all of these need to be thought about. And then we have sample collection. How many samples are we going to be able to have? Uh, you know, obviously you want a minimum of N of three, but the more uh, biological replicates that you can have, probably the better statistics you're going to get. Uh, but then also that is going to be maybe cost limited and instrument time limited. Uh, you know, we have some, some projects where it's, you know, three weeks of instrumentation time. And that's a lot of instrumentation time um, uh, that might not always be available. So you might, your sample size might be limited to that. What type of sample? Are you going to be working with tissue or cells? Um, how are you going to store the samples and how are you going to you know, acquire the samples. So again, these are things that you need to consider when you're designing your experiment. Now, sample preparation is probably the hardest and really is hard to, uh, this actually takes probably a little bit of experimental uh, testing before you do the full study. 
whenever we do a metabolomic or a proteomic study, we usually do a little test sample, no matter what it is first, just to make sure that our sample collection and our sample pre preparation is giving us the kind of data that we're hopeful for. Um, it's worth the effort to do just a little bit instead of you know prepping 27 samples and having them all have a problem with them and have to redo the whole experiment. It's much easier just to you know redo a little bit of the experiment. But here is uh, considerations with optimal extractions and all the kinds of categories of metabolites have a different optimal extraction. So there's not just kind of one size fits all. As I go through my talk, I'm gonna give you different recipes, but uh, it's really dependent on what your metabolite interests are. Um, and other things with sample preparation, are you going to be spiking in any internal standards? And if you are gonna be spiking in internal standards, what are those and at what step of the extraction are you going to be adding them? Are you going to incorporate any kind of stable isotope labeling for quantitative work? And again, are you interested in polar compounds, nonpolar compounds, or both? And this gets back even to um, thinking about what polarity you're going to be operating your mass spectrometer in. Um, and you know, are you able to buy standards that help you develop your method? Uh, so for example, uh, we've recently done a large project in looking at glycolipids. And so can we buy glycolipid standards that help us evaluate things like what polarity we're going to be uh, analyzing the sample and what optimal extractions there are. And again, I kind of touched on data analysis, but actually data analysis is really, really critical and probably um, is still a bottleneck for metabolomics. You know, proteomics uh, type applications is pretty slick with all of the uh, data analysis software. It's pretty easy. Metabolomics is enormously challenging. Um, compared to other kind of omics technologies. It's come a long way in the last, you know, maybe five years. But uh, I would say when I talk to graduate students and things at meetings, that's the biggest hurdle is like, I have all this data and now I just don't have the bioinformatic tools to process it. Okay, so we're gonna start with sample collection. And sample collection uh, really obviously is gonna depend on what kind of sample that you're looking at. So I have samples broken down into tissue, cells, plasma serum, and uh, urine would fall under there too. So um, we uh, recommend that the tissue is uh, snap froze in liquid nitrogen immediately after it's been collected and then store at minus 80 until you're ready to do uh, your uh, sample preparation extractions. And cells, cells um, can be a little tricky depending on whether they're adherent or uh, suspension cells, but the uh, cells, the metabolism that is ongoing at the time of your experiment needs to be stopped or arrested. So we call that quenching. And so this is um, so that you can obtain the picture of what is going on right at that moment. Um, and then uh, plasma and serum uh, is a challenge because the, um, the phlebotomist uh, oftentimes is kind of busy. And, um, and so care has to be taken that the plasma is stored quickly and properly. Um, plasma is very unstable and the metabolites in are very unstable. And so we try to tell our collaborators to extract the metabolites as soon as possible. Obviously, this is easier done when you're doing things like mouse and rat than humans, but, um, but careful uh, uh, storage of plasma has to be uh, able to uh, be undertaken. Um, otherwise, you're not going to have good data from it. So in general, we do recommend to extract the metabolites as soon as possible and store the extracts rather than storing the sample. Um, the only exception with that would be tissue. Tissue you know, can be at the minus 80 while you wait to um, generate all of your samples better than cells and uh, plasma. And if you do have to um, do some freezing and stuff to minimize the freeze-thaw cycle to one cycle uh, is, is the best thing you can do. Okay, so 
Extraction of all of these metabolites is quite frequently done by a liquid phase extraction uh, of the biological material that you're interested in. And the liquid phase extraction has uh, a couple of purposes. One, it is to stop and arrest all the current met 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 metabolic activity um, because you wanna freeze the picture of what you're looking at. The other uh, is to remove the proteins from the sample. For met metabolomics, obviously, we're not interested in the protein uh, fraction and we wanna remove any of the particulates, uh, you know, cellular debris and things like that. You can utilize liquid phase extraction to also reduce the sample complexity. So uh, some people wanna extract all the metabolites possible, but we have projects, for example, where they're really, really interested in the low molecular weight metabolites and the lipids in the sample interfere with the detection because they're quite ionizable. Um, and so we use liquid phase extraction to remove those lipids and so that we're left with just the metabolite uh, fraction. Or if we're only interested in the lipids, obviously we can use the same technique and uh, uh, really enrich for the lipids uh, out of that sample. So you can, you can manipulate your liquid phase extraction to uh, enrich your sample or reduce the sample complexity. The one thing that you need to be careful of is that while you're doing this liquid phase extraction, that you're not introducing bias in sample preparation. We want the differences that we're observing in the, in the metabolomics to be because of the actual biology and not because of pipetting and uh, things like that. And so basically there are um, two kinds of extraction. There's the non-mechanical and mechanical. So mechanical meaning uh, that's typically for tissues where we have to beat up the tissue in order to extract metabolites. And then there's the non-mechanical where we're doing things like freezing and thawing to break open the cells. I do wanna point out that we add one millimolar of butyl methylphenol to our methanol uh, phase during all the extractions, which is gonna reduce the oxidation of lipids and metabolites. So it kind of stabilizes the metabolites uh, that you're trying to study because again, uh, oxidation happens during sample preparation and we don't want, that um, disrupts the identity because now you're shifting masses and things like that. So, okay. So let's talk about um, cells first. So uh, we don't we want to quench the um, the uh, metabolism, but we don't want what is called metabolite leakage. And so that's when when you uh, kind of um, the the cell membrane starts to release, and some of these metabolites leak out of the cell into the media, and that is going to cause downstream reduction in uh, your relative concentration studies because they've leaked out and you've washed, you've taken the media away. So we want to make sure that the uh, cells are remaining intact um, and they're not starting to break slowly. So we want everything to be really fast. Um, so basically, you know, with the, you have the, your suspension cells and you have your adherent cells. Uh, the uh, suspension, you're going to wash your cells very carefully uh, to remove the, um, the medium that, that you're using to grow the cells, and then you're gonna add your quenching uh, solution. Adherent has different problems. Um, definitely, you do not want to use trypsinization to lift your cells off of the plate because it has shown to cause substantial metabolite leakage. So uh, basically, uh, you're left with the physical scraping um, of the ad adherent cells, and then uh, you have to wash Usually people wash with a phosphate buffer, but phosphate buffers can be bad for downstream mass spec and difficult to remove. And so people have shown that are doing um, mass spec based metabolomics that instead of washing with PBS, you can use things like ammonium acetate. Um, they don't lyse the cells. They, they act in the same way as what the PB, PBS does to keep them happy before you quench them. Um, and then that introduces the more volatile buffer that doesn't interfere with the mass spec. And so uh, when you do your quenching, uh, it, people will actually store their quenching solution in the minus 80 freezer because they want it to be actually at about minus 40 degrees Celsius uh, when you add the, um, the quenching solution to the cells. 
And then um, people also to that quenching will can add a little bit of a buffering agent. I've read heaps, but also the um, ammonium acetate and things like that that are more mass spec friendly can be added. And that helps stop metabolite leakage when you're quenching your cells. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the non-mechanical extraction of cells here in, uh, specifically. Um, and so these are kind of, uh, th this technique is basically quenching and extracting at the same time. So there are methods where you can quench your cells and then you remove that quenching solution and then you do the extraction. Then there's other uh, workflows where the quenching solution and the uh, extraction occur in the same step or basically in the same solutions that you're deciding. And so this gets, this right here, gets us right back to the experimental design slide. And so uh, we use a number of different quenching solutions or extracting solutions, depending on the kind of metabolites that we're interested in. So when we're designing this, we have to think about these cells and what is the purpose of my experiment? Am I only interested in the lipids? Am I only interested in the amino acids? What am I interested in? And if once I decide what I'm most interested in, uh, then what solvents are best for my metabolites of interest? And we should run a trial just to make sure that we see this. So this is where you might grow just some normal cells and you do this experiment where you try the different um, quenching and extraction uh, mobile phases first to see what gives you your best data for you, what you're trying to do. Um, we use many, many different uh, iterations of solvents, but here's some common ones. Um, it's quite common to use a water acetonitrile methanol, and all of these are going to serve to primarily precipitate the protein out. You'll get a protein pellet out of the bottom and then solubilize your metabolites of interest. So as you increase the organic, you're going to increase the nonpolar metabolites more and more the uh, lipids and, um, and greasier lipids. So for example, uh, when you start adding chloroform, you start getting more of the triacyl glycerides and, and that sort of thing. Um, methanol acetonitrile acetone is another common one. Uh, this is one here, the 60% methanol with ammonium bicarbonate. That's what ABC is, is ammonium bicarbonate. This is something that you would use if you wanna quench and then remove the quenching solution and then um, extract with a different solution. Uh, this ammonium bicarbonate helps stabilize the cells to minimize the leakage, the metabolite leakage. I wanna point out that I have Eppendorf shown here, but you really probably wanna use glass as much as possible so that you're not um, extracting plastics from the Eppendorfs, which is common, especially like if you're gonna be using acetone. Um, methanol and acetonitrile are okay, but if you have the opportunity to use glass, I highly recommend it. And definitely if you're gonna be using anything that is chloroform, you must use glass. You can't use plastic for that. Um, these here are going to be ways that anything that is using chloroform methanol water is creating three phases, which I'll show in a little bit, where you have metabolites in the methanol layer, the proteins are in the water layer in the middle, and then your lipid fraction is in the bottom. So this is one way that you could do, you know, where you're reducing your sample complexity and something like this method over here with the acetonitrile methanol or the acetonitrile acetone, that's where you're trying to get everything you can, all the polar, all the nonpolar. Oh, you're not trying to do any kind of um, enrichment or anything. You're just trying to get everything you can. Okay, so um, here we have, uh, once we have put in our, our solution of choice, what we think is gonna be best or what we have tested to be best, then you're gonna vortex the sample and then you're gonna take the sample and you're gonna freeze it in liquid nitrogen for about one minute. And then you're gonna let it thaw and then you're gonna sonicate it for 10 minutes. And then you're gonna store it in minus 20 degrees for one hour to overnight. This step is actually really important because you, you really want to remove 
all the proteins that you can from the sample. So the longer that you actually let this sit and let this um, uh, uh, sit in the freezer, the more proteins are gonna precipitate out. And I'm sorry, I did forget to mention that you're gonna do the vortex freeze in liquid nitrogen thaw and sonicates two times. Some people do it three times. Um, but then yes, you stick it in the freezer for an hour overnight and you really, really try and get those proteins to precipitate out. And then uh, you're gonna centrifuge. Again, this is gonna pull down any of the cellular debris um, and any of the proteins that might kind of still be floating around in there. And then you're gonna dry the sample in a speed back. And then you're gonna resuspend your sample in your desired amount of solvent. Typically it's something like 50% acetonitrile or some 50% methanol. Um, when we're doing, when we're, our interest is lipids, we add a little bit of chloroform that helps solubilize the chloroform, but we don't, not a lot of chloroform, just a little bit. And then you're ready for mass spec. Yay. <laughs> okay. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the mechanical extraction of tissues. Um, and here again, uh, we have a tissue sample and what we need to do is beat it up. We need to get it all like, I call it like a, a tissue milkshake, because that's basically what it looks like when you're done. But um, uh, again, there are many different, uh, if you look in the literature, I think there's like 20 gazillion million different kinds of uh, uh, solutions that people use. So really it is in your best interest to do some preliminary experiments with your tissue type and what your metabolites of interest are um, to determine which is gonna be better. Um, so here we have, uh, typically it's something like 80% methanol in water, or I've seen a lot of 60% methanol in water. I, we do it actually quite a bit in 100% water because we do a second phase extraction down the road. And then you can actually even use RIPA buffer. RIPA buffer solubilizes proteins really well, which is fine. Um, it's going to, uh, you know, the, t uh, the tissue is primarily made up of a lot of proteins. And so it's not bad to focus on relaxing the proteins before you start worrying about extracting the metabolites. And then uh, we have a bead beater. It's these little tubes with these little um, beads. You buy your beads um, depending on your tissue. Uh, so we have 1.5 to three millimeter beads. The bigger the bead, the, the rougher the tissue. So like uh, for, the, for a heart tissue or whatever, we have to use the three millimeter. For plants and things like that, you could probably do the 1.5. The, where you buy your little beads, they have a chart and it says everything that you need to know about what size bead for the type of tissue that you're gonna be doing. And you can use even little, little beads if you wanted to use this method with your cells to, to break open your cells. Um, so basically you, you beat these up for a minute or two and then you sonicate for 10 minutes and then it's the same thing as what we did with the cells. We're going to store this overnight because we're trying to precipitate proteins and, and like let all the metabolites release from their tissue uh, uh, form. Um, and then we can go in two different ways. We can uh, take that and centrifuge it and you're going to be removing your um, proteins and things like that. That doesn't work if it's if you've chosen 100% water as your uh, liquid of choice in order to, to uh, make your uh, tissue um, smoothie. Um, it would only work if you had some sort of methanol or acetonitrile. Um, we uh, tend to, to, to do it in water and then we extract directly from the homogenate here uh, with whatever uh, we're doing like the acetonitrile water, methanol, that kind of thing. Okay, so again, after you have your um, uh, extraction, in order to, to, to do your uh, extraction, so people will, if they um, centrifuge their uh, homogenate, then they take the pellet and they do a secondary extraction. So they really wanna make sure that they're getting everything they can out of there or uh, as we do in our lab, we just go directly with the homogenate and we have different extraction buffers, which again, should be experimentally determined whenever possible. But good places to start are, uh, are things just like your cells with your acetonitri acetonitrile methanol. Uh, if you're focusing on lipids, um, you're gonna have some sort of chloroform added to it. 
or if you're trying to get rid of your lipids, again, this is another good way to do it. Then you're gonna vortex, again, centrifuge, uh, take the supernatant, dry it in a speed back, and then resuspend. If you're doing multiple extracts, which most people do, you're gonna wanna pull those together, okay? Okay, um, we, uh, some people actually have a hard time getting things like um, liquid nitrogen to do the freeze thaw method. And um, so there are alternatives way to break up your cells. Um, in this case, we have our cell pellet. And again, we're going to be adding our quenching or extracting solution. Uh, same thing here with the tissue. You actually can use a RIPA buffer for this step. Um, and then some of the other ones, then you, we're actually gonna use sonication to bust up uh, the cells and to do the extraction of the metabolites. Um, some people have concerns with this method because the sonication can heat up the sample or it does heat up the sample. So uh, the idea is that you wanna keep your sample as cold as possible. So if you can sonicate in a nice bath or something um, to keep it cold, um, the probe son the probe sonicators, you can keep your sample in ice while you're doing it, and that's the best option. Um, and again, then you centrifuge your sample to pull down all the proteins, you remove the supernate, dry it down in a speed bag, and then you're going to resuspend your sample and it's ready for LCMS. Okay, plasma and urine uh, is probably the easiest to extract, but again, um, we really need to think about what solvents are best uh, and what is the purpose of the experiment. Um, uh, we have done many, many different kinds of extracts with plasma or serum just because uh, the depth of metabolites in it is, is really quite amazing. And uh, so this is a good opportunity to um, play with different extractions depending on what you want. So I mentioned that we did a glycolipid project or it's still kind of ongoing, but we found out much to our pleasant surprise and happiness that the glycolipids prefer the methanol layer of a chloroform methanol water extraction. And so we are very happy because it actually pulls the glycolipids away from all the other lipids that are in the chloroform, like your phosphatidylcholines and all of those, which are in huge abundance in plasma. So we were able to enrich for the glycolipids by, by having them in the methanol layer. And we were able to basically throw out a whole fraction of lipids that we had no interest in, but are in high abundance. And so would mask the detection of the glycolipids. So that was a, that was a good, um, a good find for us. So you might want to think about that when you're doing your extractions. So uh, people simply just use 100% methanol or 100% um, acetonitrile, um, acetone. There's people that do 80% methanol in water that I see. And then again, you're, you're, you're going to vortex when you, uh, usually we take about 100 microliters of plasma you can do 20 microliters of plasma when you're doing mouse or rat because they don't have very much blood. Um, but uh, yeah, 100 microliters for a human, then that's plenty. And then you add four volumes of your um, uh, extracting solvent, you vortex it, and then you just stick it in the minus 20 for overnight is best, but an hour if you're in a hurry or as long as you can. And that really, really gets rid of the proteins. Um, and then you're going to centrifuge, oh, dry the sample is supposed to be a, a, a speed back, not a centrifuge, sorry. And then again, you're going to resuspend it in, in uh, something like 50% acetonitrile, and you are ready for your mass spec. So the chloroform methanol that I have mentioned, uh, well, there uh, forms these three layers. And one thing that is really important when you're doing your extraction, and this is what I want to show, is the centrifuge step. Uh, is really important. Um, here is uh, a chloroform methanol water extract that you can start to see that it's forming the three distinct layers, but you don't get the three distinct layers until after you centrifuge. And so when you do a chloroform methanol uh, water extract, on the bottom is your chloroform layer. That's where all your heavy lipids are. And in the middle, you can see here the white disc, that's your protein layer. 
And then on top is your methanol and that's your, your normal metabolites would go in there. Your small, your really small molecule metabolites. Um, there might be some lipids that go in there, just like I mentioned, the glycolipids tend to go in there. The tricky part is that if you want the chloroform layer is uh, we take like a gel loading tip or like a really fine, we have really fine glass capillaries that you just, cause you don't want to disrupt the protein layer. Um, it's much easier to take the methanol layer off of this, uh, this kind of extract. If you don't want to do um, this three phase layer, then, you, then this is what like, a, this is what a methanol uh, uh, precipitation looks like or isopropanol or butanol water. Okay, so the pellet, the protein pellet just simply goes on the bottom and the supernatant that you're removing is this liquid here. But again, you want to make sure that you centrifuge because you want to pull down all the all those particulates and proteins as possible. Okay, next up, and this is again back to your uh, experimental design, is how are you going to normalize your sample? And what I mean by normalize is if you're doing quantitative metabolomics, you have to find a way that you're going to be doing your sample prep so that the same amount of your sample is loaded, that otherwise you're not gonna get any meaningful data of your uh, up and down regulated metabolites. And so sample normalization can be really easy or it can be really hard. Um, and it really depends on what you're doing. So tissue is could be the easiest, uh, you can base that on weight. But when you start to think about it, it can be pretty tricky. Um, let's say that you're, looking at mouse heart. If you try and weigh out and uh, uh, measure equal amounts of weight of a heart, you're probably having to cut some, some mouse hearts off and then you don't have the whole heart, you're missing part of it. So then that's not really the whole metabolism of that heart. Um, so that, that can get, same thing uh, we encountered with, we were doing um, uh, some, leaves or something and well then you're missing part of the leaf and so that it can, tissue sounds like it can be easy but sometimes it can be kind of challenging it just depends um then you can also normalize post extraction and people do that by measuring total protein total dna concentration and i'm going to just briefly talk about how we're doing it by measuring total lipid concentration um, and uh, there's a lot of debate on these techniques. How does the total protein correlate to metabolites? But unfortunately, there really isn't any other way to do it. So we just kind of have to do it that way and, and live with it. Cells, you can do it by um, using the same amount of cell count. That's probably the best way. And again, you can do uh, protein concentration, DNA concentration, um, and total lipid concentration. Serum is pretty nice because you could just do it by volume. Everybody gets hundred microliters and that's it. Um, but if that's not uh, part of the experimental design, if for some reason there's different volumes of serum, then you're back to having to normalize based off of your protein concentration DNA. And how you do this is what, whatever you find out to be your concentration, you dilute your sample so that everything has the same amount, one microgram per mil or whatever. So some might have 12 microliters and some might have four microliters, uh, but they all have the same concentration of whatever you're normalizing to. So just very quickly, I'm gonna talk about how we've been using the sulfophosphovanillin assay to normalize loading for quantitative lipid analysis. We do quite a bit of lipidomics in our facility. And uh, traditionally what people do for um, measuring, for normalizing lipid samples is to measure total protein and then multiply by four. And you know we don't really think, we're not really sure about that that's the best way to do it. And so I came across a paper from like 1968 that uses this colometric assay to measure total uh, lipid. And basically what it is, is that you react your lipid with sulfuric acid, which produces a uh, cation uh, at wherever the double bond is. So any, any lipid that has a double bond in the alkyl chain reacts with this um, sulfuric acid. And then when you, uh, the, this uh, cation lipid reacts with vanillin and it makes a chromophore, which then can be measured spectrophotog 
mint tree, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> makes a nice little pink color. And so we can generate calibration curves um, and we are playing around with different lipid um, uh, mixtures in order to uh, make this calibration curve. So, you know, is it, uh, and all of this is dependent on the lipid sample that you're working with. Um, is it high in like phosphatidylcholines or is it high in cholesterols, things like that. And you can see here that we get very similar results to the protein assay um, as what we do, but we just feel like measuring total lipids to normalize for lipids could be a better way to do this than measuring um, by protein. And we get really nice uh, reproducibility with it as well. Okay, so uh, internal standards. Um, internal standards is a headache that everybody dreads talking about because uh, again, metabolomics is so challenging, especially compared to proteomics. Proteomics has like, kind of been really easy uh, to solve all of these problems. Um, it's quite easy to add uh, uh, internal standards for proteomics, but metabolomics is so complex uh, with all the different kinds of metabolites, all the different polarities, all the different, uh, you know, classes of metabolites. Um, it's, there's just not a one size fits all. So basically all of us doing metabolomics are left to our own, <laughs> to make up our own internal standards for the most part. Um, so the use of internal standards that I'm speaking about here are to evaluate your retention time stability, your extraction efficiency, your mass accuracy, your changes in instrument performance over time. I'm not talking about internal standards that would be used for quantitation. That's would be more of a targeted approach and I'm just sticking to untargeted for this talk. Now, thankfully for lipidomics, the wonderful Avanti Polar Lipids has come up with a mixture that we can use as an internal standard very easily. It's called Splash, and it contains 14 deuterated lipids using uh, one internal standard per lipid class. So there's one cholesterol, there's one um, phosphatidylcholine, one phosphatidylinosine, things like that. And uh, you can, we just add five microliters at the time of extraction, and it helps us evaluate um, the mass specs. We don't really use it. The, the client, the customer, the researcher that is using our facility doesn't really even see any of that data, but we use it so that we can see if like there's a really weird outlier, you know, uh, an extract gone really bad, um, a mass spec gone really bad, things like that. So that's, that's what we're looking at. If you are not doing lipids and you can't use the splash, splash mixture, then what we usually do is we select about six to eight stable isotope metabolites appropriate for the study. So, you know, same thing uh, for our glycolipids, uh, we've had to kind of make our own mixture. However, the more uh, unconventional metabolites that you're studying, the harder that this is because the stable isotopes are just not available. Um, there's thousands and thousands of stable isotopes that are available, but, um, uh, if you're unlucky enough to be working with something that, that, that's just not, um, common, you're not going to be, it's going to be a struggle and very, very, very expensive. And so then you'll have to maybe think of a different, uh, way to, you know, evaluate the stability of your instrumentation and your runs. Um, one thing that we do is to, for quality control, is about every 10 samples, we run a pooled uh, sample. So we, we pool like five microliters from every sample and that's our, that's our pooled sample. And we use that um, as QC evaluation. Um, there is a technology called uh, IROA and they have kind of a clever design where they have 95% C13 and a 5% uh, C13 of a yeast metabolites um, it, it introduces a different level of complexity to your already complex sample. So I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm just, you know, starting to read about it and see some, um, papers on it and things like that. So, but definitely metabolomics companies are starting to realize that they need to have a better internal standard, um, uh, something a little bit more standardized. 
And lastly, that I want to talk about is external contamination. We don't want to introduce anything that is going to, uh, you know, disrupt the actual study. So obviously, keeping your workbenches clean, um, you really want to go out of your way to minimize, uh, like things like glycerol and PEG. Um, they severely affect your LCMS, and they may even ruin your HPLC columns. And these includes um, soap detergents. So, you know, we don't rinse our, we don't wash our glassware and things like that with soaps and detergent. We wash them with like methanol and isopropanol. Um, things like hand creams have a lot of these uh, components in it. Um, and a lot of the plastics, this is why we, the more and more we do with lipidomics and um, metabolomics, the more we go to glass, we have glass pipettes. We don't, we use very little plastics anymore. Um, make sure to wear your powder-free gloves, change them frequently. Uh, in this case, the gloves aren't to protect you, it's to protect your sample from yourself. <laughs> um, and yes, uh, use the glass. So that is what I have. I am ready to answer some questions. I just wanted to share uh, some of my, these are my colleagues, my, grad, my people I went to graduate school with. I have four boys, um, but I love teaching and I love working at the university and I love working with my students. So let's Great. see. Here. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Basel. Uh, uh, very nice talk. There are a few questions, and um, probably I'll just uh, answer the first one very easy. It says, are freeze dry tissues good for metabolomic studies? I would say yes. And um, a lot of times, actually, it's better to use them. Um, to use a dry weight. And uh, especially, you know, if tissues have a different level of water. Uh, so in plants, we actually lifelize, freeze dry, and you can store in, um, in um, you know, like a dehydrant and keep it away from water. Um, so you, you can even store at room temperature. So Dr. Basso, there are several questions for you. I'll just read uh, to you, okay? Why is, um, is one millimolar butyl mesophenol recommended for plant extracts? Uh, I would, anything that you want to prevent uh, oxidation, um, we add it to. We, we pretty much, it's a standard, a standard addition to our methanol for metabolomics. Yeah, I agree with that. And uh, in the video you're going to see from uh, Yang Yang Li, we actually add this to our metabolized instructions. So the next question is, will the PBS concentration affect cell washing process you mentioned? Um, so that's, that's probably a good question. Um, I think just your standard PBS that uh, everybody uses for cell washes is what people are using when they do this step. Um, so uh, you don't want it to be like too, cons you don't want to lyse the cells by having it too isotonic either. So you want just a nice gentle um, solution to make those cells happy while you're doing this stuff. Great, yes. Uh, the next question is, will the sample prep process of human cells the same as the plant cells? So actually, Dr. Chen, that, uh, I might ask you that because are the plant cell membranes more, do you need to use the bead beaters for plants, for plant cells? Yeah, the difference between animal cells and plant cells, the major difference of course is a cell wall. Yeah. Sometimes the plant cells really, you know, hard to break. Yeah. I mean, they need to use a really harsh conditions. I would suggest that if you have a method developed for human cells, you can use that as a starting point that optimize that for your plant cell extraction. You know, for example, do, you're gonna use harsh conditions like bees to break up the cells. And then you do like multiple extractions and uh, each extraction you see how much metabolites or, or, or features still left. So I would definitely optimize, you know, for plant cell applications. Okay. So the next question is, um, uh, do the zirconium bees leave out contaminants into your sample? Should you so, use basic wash before the first usage or cleaning? 
Yes. Um, so we wash our zucarnium beads before uh, we do our experiment with methanol or isopropanol, one of those two things. And we do not reuse ours. Um, one of the reasons that we use these little um, uh, bead tubes and stuff is that we don't want any contamination. So like people may choose to uh, beat up their tissue with a mortar and pestle but we found that so time consuming because the amount of washing between each tissue type is just because you, you don't want any contamination at all. And so uh, we stopped doing that. Um, but I, I know people reuse their zirconium or their silica beads. We do not. We, uh, we, um, we, it's a one time use and we throw them away. But yes, we do wash them with methanol first. Great, great comment. Another question is, how do you process dry samples like dry seeds? Mm. Uh, so uh, dry samples and things like that, like seeds, we, we just crush them. Uh, uh, that, that might, uh, where we use the mortar and pestle and, and we just crush them. And then we, then we throw in our uh, extracting solvent. Uh, Dr. Chen, you might have a comment on that too. You're the plant guy. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, we do the same. Uh, we really crush them and we use, um, you know, um, mortar pastel and um, the same is true with, um, you know, roots and, you know, like a cassava roots. So, you know, it's pretty hard to, uh, you know, you, have, you just have to hammer them and crush them and yeah. get as much out as possible using multiple extractions. Okay, the next question is, I read some papers on using computational metabolomics techniques instead of using internal standard. What is your perspective on this? Yeah, that is uh, some interesting work. Um, I really have to read more on this. It's, you know, it's new to me, um, but I don't know. I still think that, uh, an internal standard that is used, the purpose of the internal standard is to be monitoring the performance of the instrument. Um, and I just don't see how you can do that without putting it by having data from the instrument. Yeah, I don't know. Probably this question is more about like, I don't know, using AI kind of like, uh, you know, like a predicting yeah. tension time, you know, all that. Um, but you yeah. know, Anything with AI, you need to have a very good training data sets. Um, again, with a real internal standard, you know, I agree, will be very, very important because different people use different columns, different conditions. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's so much that it can go wrong with a LCMS experiment. Uh, the mm -hmm. electrospray can... Um, be the problem, the column can be the problem, the mass spec can be the problem. So, uh, and you can sort it all out, but you, you have to have real data to be able to, to sort that out. So I'm, I'm a strong proponent of like actual internal standards that are measuring the performance of the mass spec. Yeah, me too. Um, this may be the last question. It says, if you prefer going for glass for everything, how do you evaluate the uh, ab 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 absorption loss to the glass? Mm, yes. See, and that is, um, it, an, it's just the, uh, the, the problems with experimental design can be never ending. Um, we don't, we want to minimize plastic because we don't want to extract plastic, which is really bad for the mass spec. If, if all you are detecting is PEG in your system, you will never see any of your metabolites and it just wrecks the whole experiment. So, um, but uh, every, every part of your experimental design has a pitfall. And basically you have to decide what you can live with um, and what is gonna be minimal for your experiment. So, um, uh, you know, one thing like we hate, for example, we, we do not like taking our sample to dryness because it is absorbed onto the plastic or the glass. So we try and watch when we're drying down our sample so that it is just dried down. You know, it's not like we leave it in overnight and just let it like bake to death <laughs> in mm -hmm. there. Um, so yeah, everything is, 
every step is something to consider and you just have to weigh what is most important to your system. Yeah, I'm sorry to say that uh, that was not the last question. There's still a few. Um, maybe oh, okay. we just, um, we just uh, keep going. I mean, this is a great discussion. Uh, so another question is, um, can lipids found in untargeted metabolomics without specific lipid preparation steps? Yes, so like some of the ones that I um, showed that were like uh, methanol, acetonitrile water type um, extraction, that is really a universal extraction. You're gonna have metabolites and lipids. Uh, we have uh, is, it, things like if you add some acetone definitely are going to improve your lipid detection. So, um, you know, for sure, if, if you're trying to, to have the widest range of metabolites possible, there's definitely um, those, some of those solvent systems that are appropriate for that. Uh, again, it all comes down to your experimental design. What, what did you want? What do you want to see? And you base everything downstream off of that. Yeah, and uh, the next question is about uh, identify the protein uh, fraction. Um, yes, definitely. You can just uh, do trypsin digestion, do shock on proteomics and uh, measure and identify the protein fraction. And Yang Yang Li, uh, who gonna present next, gonna show you. And uh, for you, uh, Dr. Basso, is, uh, do you re reuse uh, ultra filters to remove the protein from plasma? Do I reuse or do we? Yeah. Do you do you reuse those filters? No, I don't, we don't reuse anything. In fact, even when we do proteomics, once we open up a bottle of trips and we throw it out because mm -hmm. uh, now I, I'm a service facility. And so we don't have, we, every experiment has to work basically. Um, like when you're a graduate student, I had to, you know, use my trips and over and over again. So, uh, you know, it, it but um, you really, any, any amount of cross-contamination between samples will ruin your metabolomic experiment. So anything you can do to use fresh and uh, you know, not um, reuse anything is, is best. And the next one is, can I use the reaper buffer for uh, plant protein extraction? Yep. Okay, yes, the answer is yes. And um, um, I, we have, we have buffers, we have um, extraction buffers that are specifically for membrane bound proteins. That is not a RIPA buffer. If you're interested in, in, in being able to really extract membrane proteins, I'd be happy to share it with you. You can email me directly. And then the next one, um, must the weight of the samples be the same, like the different samples, like plant leaves, do you want to make them the same? or will this influence the um, relative quantification? Yeah, that's, uh, that's the tricky thing is, um, uh, I think probably uh, for plants, you know, the freeze dried is the, is the best way. You're weighing, you're weighing the dry weight then, right? Not the liquid weight. So that's, that was gonna be your, your most accurate, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would definitely use as similar weight as possible. Um, yeah. Otherwise, you have to adjust your extraction, um, you know, buffer or solution volumes, you know, kind of um, to make sure the, the volume and weight, they're kind of consistent in consistent ratios. Um, so you can, you want to make sure they have equal kind of extraction efficiency uh, between the samples. The next one, is it standard to include a splash mix when you do lipidomics? Um, it is something that we have started to do in the last year or so. I think the splash mix has been available for three years now. Um, we've just started, uh, in the last year or so to routinely add it to our lipidomics. It works really good for monitoring the performance of our instrument. And I like it because it's only 14. Um, I don't like adding internal standards that add a huge amount of complexity to your sample because you already have a complex sample and you want to be doing MSMS of your unknowns, not your internal standards. So, um, uh, so uh, we like it. It works good. Yeah. Is it enough to just include a one 
internal standards? Um, I, I know people that do that. And uh, the reason that the splash is nice for lipids is that it contains one lipid per class. So you get, and because the different um, lipid classes ionize differently. And so if something weird is going on, you can, it, it helps you troubleshoot, I guess is basically what I'm saying. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, the next question is about how you dry the samples. I actually prefer using the nit nitrogen stream um, rather than rotor evaporators. Um, you know, also we do lifelization. Uh, so to try to keep the sample cold. And the next question is about, um, would you expect the same lipid profile of the same sample run on a QTQ and QTOF? Well, a lot of that is going to depend on your column and your mobile phases um, more than probably the, the mass spec itself. Um, mm -hmm. As far as identification, you probably will be able to get more identifications off of a QTOF because you have the advantage of the high resolution mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. data. Yeah, this is the last question we have time for. <laughs> um, so um, uh, I read different uh, several papers that add different kinds of buffer to sample for better, I think, extraction. Can this affect the metabolized content in the sample? Of course, that's like the uh, premise of uh, my my uh, whole first couple of slides is where what you are putting in is going to depend on the uh, metabolites that you get out. And are you interested in the polar metabolites? Are you interested in nonpolar? Are you trying, to, you know, people spend a lot of time developing their extraction pro protocols based off of this. I didn't even get into double extraction, but you know, people will add you know, say those, uh, say like the methanol water acetonitrile, and then they get their pellet, which in theory should be mostly protein, but there would be some insoluble metabolites in there. So then you might add acetone to that pellet and uh, repeat the process. And then you're gonna get some more nonpolar metabolites that you can add to that fraction. Um, the tricky part though, is that when you're resuspending your sample after you've dried it down, you got to resuspend it in something that is also going to still solubilize that wide range of polarity metabolites that you've extracted, which is why I mentioned you might want to add like 10% chloroform or something like that to, uh, to solubilize those. So for sure, what you are using as your extraction buffers is going to determine what metabolites you're, you're getting out. Great. This is a really nice discussion. Let's thank uh, Dr. Kari Basso again for a really Thank nice you. presentation. Thank you so much.